Hi, and welcome to this first episode of the archived stream of my development of OBBG. The original actual stream was lost, so I'm going to re-record right now something just to fill in the gaps there. So OBBG, it's a demo sample game for stbvoxelrender.h. Uh, I'm hoping to put in lots of stuff uh, and make not necessarily a real game, but a full, a full set of features that a game would have. Um, it's not specifically a Minecraft clone, although I'm obviously putting in, <coughs> excuse me, most of the features of Minecraft. So you can see over here, I have a list of the basic ideas. Um, so, to start with, uh, we'll start with the state it was before I streamed at all, which do this. Uh, all right. And then this should be uh, a program that does nothing and takes a while to load to do it. Uh, why is this? Because it had old objects. All right. <clears throat> so what this uh, program is, is I took KView, the Minecraft viewer, and took the main loop out of that and this program, this file called main. Uh, so it includes some stats display, but it doesn't actually commit to stats. It includes a camera um, that uh, is keyboard control, lets you steer around, lets you fly. Uh, and that's it. You know, it sets up all the SDL stuff. Then I have a texture loader and the repository at this stage has uh, the Pixar released some textures from the 80s, I think, or 90s, uh, 128 textures that are 1K by 1K. And I went ahead and converted them with uh, Rich Geldrich's crunch tool uh, to DXT, compressed, uh, compressed version of DXT, and put that in the repository. Uh, and then I actually have a version of them that's only 512 by 512 um, so that uh, if you're on a platform that doesn't have DXC, you can use this, although I haven't hooked it up. So at runtime, I just load all of those textures here, <clears throat> and I do nothing else with it. So that's why we had a blank screen when we ran it. So that was where I started the initial stream. Uh, so get the basics working. So let's take a look at get the basics working. So at this point, I've added a couple of files. I've added mesh builder, added some header files, and I've added voxel render. And this program takes a while to load. Okay, so here, I've gotten the very beginnings of this thing working. Uh, the spikes are, this was just some really simple data I could put in so that I could show that it was a varying world. It's different everywhere. As I scroll along in it, you can see the heights are all, of the spikes are all different. All right, so let's look at what I did to get here. Uh, most of this code was copied and pasted out of the demo that I used to make the STB voxel render uh, uh, trailer, but uh, I kind of rewrote uh, it as I went, uh, and the mesh builder uh, file is pretty much rewritten from scratch, whereas this one is much more copy and pasted. So. Um, let's start with the top level function, render voxel world. So 
the world is divided up into chunks. They're called mesh chunks. The, the are the meshes that are drawable. So uh, I find out which chunk I am, and then I traverse a square around that, find the mesh for that, and I draw it. So that's part. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the uniforms, the only uniforms that change that need to be set every time. There's a transform that's a three vectors. And then I have to set the attribute array with the vertex data and set the uh, texture buffer with the face data. So the texture data is um, four bytes per vertex and the face data is four bytes per face. And so using the texture buffer allows me to actually share that data across the whole face. So it uses 20 bytes per quad instead of 32 bytes per quad. So, uh, so that's why this has got that extra bind texture. Uh, and then up here, we set up all of the uniforms that are needed by the program that are stay the same while we're drawing all the meshes. So let's take a look at that function. This again is cut and pasted out of, uh, this is also in KVIEW, I think in a similar way. Um, so the idea is that uh, you iterate over the uniforms that the SDB voxel render knows about and you call get uniform info, which tells you what it wants it to do. Uh, and then I have a bunch of effectively static tables that I'm going to use to fill out this stuff. So uh, the face data, that's a texture buffer we just saw. I have to say which uh, texture unit uh, it's bound to. Uh, here, the texture array is the actual texture data that it does multi-texture with two textures. So you have to actually set that up. Uh, so here we bind the textures to a sampler. And then here we set up the uniform array with what the two samplers are. Uh, the camera position that's used for fog, the lighting, this is just cut and pasted exactly out of KVIEW, I think, or the or out of the SCP voxel render demo. Uh, and then once you've set up these tables, you just, whichever type it is, you set it up. So there's really um, nothing complicated going on here. It's just a lot of code because you have to set up a lot of uniforms. Okay, and then, the only other thing that this file does is the init, which is basically to just set up the vertex and shader. So it gets these from the stb voxel render that returns me the shaders. And then I call a little helper function that I wrote in my little stb gl prog libra library, which uh, is not officially released, but it's in this uh, source tree if you want to look at it. And it's just a little helper thing that makes this easier to do. So all the actual crazy work happens in Mesh Builder. So let's take a look how many lines of file this is. This is 205 lines, and this is 370 lines. So Mesh Builder is where it all happens. Um, OBBG Funks is just all the functions that for calling from one function to another. I'm experimenting with this idea of just putting them all in one header file instead of having a header file per file, because uh, I don't think there's much benefit to that uh, when I'm building C and it's pretty fast. And um, so here's some shared data that needs to be accessed from both. So they both need to know about this mesh data structure and this mesh cache data structure here. So the mesh cache is keeping a little sliding window around the player. So uh, the max view distance is uh, 2048 and so then the cache is 4096 around it so these are log two of those numbers uh, and then the mesh is divided into like the mesh each mesh is covers a 64 by 64 region uh, so um, even though it's always square I have separate variables for it in case it weren't square but there are places where the code pretty much assumes it's square so um, it's kind of dumb and then the cache has to be large enough to cover this region, so it does a little math to figure that out. But effectively, we know that since this is the 12, the cache is covering uh, 2 to the 12, and this is 2 to the 6, and this is going to be 2 to the 6. So we know we have a 64 by 64 cache of the meshes. Uh, 
Now, a thing about the code right now is that it never actually frees up a mesh slot unless it gets reused. Like you go 64 chunks and now it, it needs to reuse a chunk that's wrapped around in that mesh. Uh, and that means that it may try to allocate way too many meshes, the, you know, the full 4,096 meshes that could use up a ton of mesh memory. It will never free them except when it tries to allocate a new one. So that's just a limitation of that program that actually exists um, for at least um, several more episodes since I, to date, still have not fixed that. Uh, but that's probably the next thing I'm going to do. So, Mesh Builder. Um, so what do we have to do? Well, we're doing procedural generation. So we're going to generate chunks of terrain. Um, and the Mesh Builder, uh, sorry about the knocking if you can hear that. Somebody upstairs. Uh, the mesh builder uh, requires, you know, I said it was 64 by 64 blocks is what it covers. But to compute that, to build that mesh, it actually needs the adjacent blocks immediately around it. Uh, it needs a 66 by 66 region. Um, so it, uh, since we're generating the terrain in chunks, I can't just access the blocks immediately around it. I need to access the chunks around it. Um, so if I used a 64 by 64 chunk, then I would need nine chunks, right? The one in the middle and the eight around it, including the diagonals. Uh, and each of those would be 64 by 64. So I would need, uh, you know, 192 by 192 blocks of data. So I do a, something a little different. Um, my procedural chunks are instead 32 by 32, so they're half the size. And that means that the mesh, which is 64 by 64, is going to need two by two chunks to make up the core data that the mesh covers. And then it's going to need around the edges, it's going to need um, uh, you know, 32 by 32s on the sides and in the corners. Um, and so it needs four by four chunks instead of three by three chunks, but they're smaller chunks. Um, so uh, it needs 16 chunks instead of nine chunks. Now, 16 is almost twice as big as nine, but the chunks are half the size in each dimension. Uh, so it uses, needs about half the data to do it. And you could make them even smaller uh, to get a better win there, but as you make the chunk size smaller, um, you lose some efficiency in generating the chunks. Uh, Minecraft uses 16 by 16, I think. So um, so those are called gen chunks, and you can see that here. And I also keep a cache of gen chunks, but I don't try to keep cache way out to cover the view distance. The view distance needs to be covered by meshes so you can see. But once I use the gen chunk to create a mesh, I throw it away, potentially. So I keep a much smaller cache. Uh, here it's five by five where the, or 32 by 32, where the mesh chunks are 64 by 64. But mainly what this means is the mesh chunks cover a 4K by 4K region and the gen chunks cover a 1K by 1K region because they're half the size and half the cache size <coughs> in each dimension. And, and that matters because the gen chunks are actually pretty big. Um, so, uh, Then in the vertical dimension, um, I limit my max Z uh, here to 255. That's because the mesh mode that I'm using in STV voxel rendered on H can generate meshes that cover blocks up to 127 by 127 by 255. Um, assuming you're using half height blocks, you could go up to 511 if not. And so the easiest thing to do is to just not dice the meshes at all vertically because I'm trying to draw a lot of meshes. I want to be able to draw out pretty far in the distance. And if I diced my meshes vertically, they would, I would have a ton more meshes to draw. So drawing meshes 64 by 64 by 255, you know, with a view distance of um, uh, 1,024, uh, that's uh, 2 to the 10, so divided by two to the six is two to the four, so it's 16 by 16. That's 256 meshes to draw a square that's 1K by 1K. But I can set the view distance actually out to, in my SV voxel render demo, I set it to 1920. Um, so that's four times as much data. So that would be 4,000 ballpark, probably 3,000 
meshes uh, in the radius around you, and then because of view frustum, you may be drawing a third of them, so maybe a thousand draw calls. So, uh, you know, new graphics APIs are a little less expensive for draw calls, but uh, it's still worth keeping it reasonable. And, you know, if we divided our meshes to 32 by 32 by 32 or something like that, we would have a lot more of them, uh, enough that I think it would be a problem. So, uh, so the chunks, uh, the gen chunks use the same thing. They're 255 tall. But for some crazy reason to do with cache usage that I haven't really experimented with to see that this matters, uh, and also I was hoping to save memory, but <coughs> I didn't, wasn't able to, I divide the, the gen chunk. I'm going to have the full gen chunk be 32 by 32 by 255. But I divide it up into uh, 32 by 32 by 16 pieces. So here's one of those pieces, a partial. And then I have a bunch of them and some flags for whether they're empty or not. The idea there is to just skip if the procedural generator knows it didn't fill in any data in some of the regions, it can skip them, and that maybe this would cache uh, better when it's doing that, even though I don't actually have any code to do that to date as well. So then I keep these two caches for the, the mesh chunks that are what get rendered and the gen chunks, uh, and then I just have these sort of direct mapped caches uh, and this is buggy code that we'll see the fixes for uh, later, um, right? But so the basic idea is I take in world coordinates, uh, which are in blocks, and then shift them. This is a macro to shift it by the right amount, then mask it by the chunk, and that tells me where it falls in the cache. And then I check if that's the one that's in the cache and use it. Uh, and that's the part that's buggy, is that's check comparing against the wrong value. <clears throat> so uh, so we have a thing to get the mesh chunks and a thing to get the gen chunks out of their respective caches. We have something to initialize their caches that sets their x value to an invalid value so it will never match. Uh, generate chunk, this is the uh, procedural generation call. So we compute a ground plane. Uh, we set everything to empty. We set the lighting to bright. Um, then we fill in from, uh, what do we do? We draw just a single row. Uh, we draw a single block at each uh, column at the right height. And then here, for one column, we fill in a random height. and that it's the spikes and one of the things that means is that uh, there's just a floating solid block here for this ground plane so I can go under it and then you can see the bottom of it because it's just a single floating block so um, this function is like the other one but if it fails it goes ahead and generates the chunk that was requested. So if you call this function instead of the other one, it will always return you a correct chunk for the one you want. Okay, that's the procedural generation. Now we get to the mesh building. So this code was largely cut and pasted from uh, the SCP voxel render demo and then hand changed one line at a time to, to be correct. So, um, It takes the uh, various output buffers it's going to write to chunk set, which is a four by four grid of gen chunks. Um, so this is the storing what the coordinates are going to be. This is mesh, mesh chunk actually already lives in the cache. So you have to set these so that that's correct. Uh, this sets the stride of the 3D arrays that we're going to pass into the SDB voxel render. So the X coordinate steps by 66 times 18, the Y coordinate steps by 18. You can see that's because this is what we're going to be passing in. So this goes X, Y, and Z. The Z coordinate always steps by one, the Y coordinate steps by 18, the X coordinate steps by 66 times 18. And that's so that SDB voxel render doesn't have to have a compile time dependency on those sizes, you have to set it explicitly. Uh, 
Uh, here we set some data that's used for translating the block types to get the textures out of the modeling. Here we set our output buffers. Remember I said there were two buffers, the, the vertex buffer, that's this one, and the face buffer. And you can see the face buffer is a core size. Remember I said this would be 16 bytes per quad, and this is four bytes per quad. So this one is core the size. Um, so the area that we're building, we've gone build a little chunk, a partial chunk at a time. So it's 64 by 64 by 16. And then we, SDB voxel render needs a border, as I said, one on each side, one on each side and one above and below. So then when we pass it into it, we actually pass in the address of the first block that's actually part of the region that we're doing. Um, that's just how SDB voxel render wants it. We're going to go from the top to the bottom. So we start by filling in two rows of data at the top uh, and then work our way down. Um, and then we'll see what happens. So then, uh, so we're at the top, we're at the 240 by 16. Um, now we copy the chunk data, which is spread out over 16 different chunks. In, we copy that into these, t these temporaries these block type segment type things. So you can see that code is here. We iterate over all the 16 chunks. Uh, we figure out what part of those chunks actually overlaps the thing, because if it's like the corner, there's actually only gonna be one block that's used. And then we iterate over all the ones that are used and copy their data in this gross thing here. Uh, and later I have, I'll improve that code. Uh, later in the later episode, I think. Um, so at that point, we've set up all the inputs. So then we tell it what range we want to do. So you know, this is the standard C exclusive, so inclusive exclusive. So it goes from zero, zero, Z zero to less than 64, less than 64, less than Z one. Um, this is a special thing that SV voxel render can set multiple outputs in a weird way and then we tell it to build this. So this builds concatenates onto the current data that we're building, the mesh, uh, in, on, into the current outputs but uh, allows it to continue. Um, then we remember how we initialized the first two topmost rows well, with uh, sort of zero data. Um, then now we copy the the bottom two rows to the top two rows, and then the next time around the loop, we'll copy 16 more data things of data below that. Um, that's how we get the 18 tall overlap while we're only building 16 at a time. Once we're done with all of that, we'll have built 16, we'll have called this make mesh 16 times. It'll have kept concatenating all the data into the mesh. So uh, here we build the transform the uniforms that we're going to use for this mesh to put it in the right place. Uh, the bounds, which we don't use currently. Uh, and we don't have to get the output data because we passed that in originally right here. So it's already written to the right place. Okay, what does that do? So the renderer calls build mesh chunk for cord. Uh, we check the mesh cache or actually it's not the, so if we don't have it, we check the mesh cache, we free an existing mesh if there is one, we build the chunk set, we initialize the mesh maker, and we call that function we just looked at, which builds it into those two buffers, then we call upload mesh with those two buffers. There's this function here, which just does the appropriate OpenGL magic for creating this stuff, uh, and then that's it. That's all the code that's involved in getting this uh, thing going. Now you notice that the load time is a little slow there and that it, load time is it loading all those Pixar textures. So one of the things that we change pretty soon is not checking them all out by default. Okay, so now um, let's see what's the last um, okay, there's a couple more updates from the first day. So, 
Uh, okay, so let's take a look at it first. Uh, I checked it in without it working. That's weird. Oh, I have to exit that and restart it. Or I forgot to check in the DSP file. It's quite possible. Yeah. Because um, cause it's easy to forget to check the DSP file in because it doesn't get written out automatically when you change it. Okay, so here I've got some procedural terrain generating here. Um, one thing you can see is there are pauses here, and that's a pause when it goes when I cross a boundary uh, in the chunk cache and access a new row, and it has to access all of the same row all at once. So it ends up building the entire row around the viewpoint or along that line. So it takes a noticeable pause and I'm running in debug mode. Uh, and that's something that we, we will fix over the next uh, few episodes. It takes a while to, f to get this all fixed to run in the background and be fast. So uh, let me check one other thing. Um, Oh, I shouldn't have done it this way because I forgot how long it takes to do this. Okay, so what's changed here? Um, okay, so there's some bug fixes here. New terrain generation. Um, bug fixes. I don't even see what's changed there. Oh, they reversed bug fixes. Which reversing this doesn't change anything. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so as I mentioned, there are some bugs in these functions. Um, this or was originally masking. Okay, do I have one that? stores it no this is originally doing this mask up here but then that meant that this was comparing against mask value. And the whole point of this is that multiple different chunks can map to the same slot and i want to check that the right chunk is there so masking to mapping to the slot is done with the mask so i want to mask it look what's in the slot with the masking and then compare against the value um, that's unmasked because if i masked the value that I was comparing and mass the value that I stored into these, it would always match any two chunks that fell in the same slot. So that was that block. So then the procedural generation, uh, I generate a little height field using Perlin noise um, down here. And uh, there's actually uh, this weight that's sort of a pix between two biomes and chooses between raw Perlin noise and this squared Perlin noise. Um, and I compute the sign and never multiply by it again, so that's a bug. And how do we generate the chunks now? We compute a height field. We compute that into this height field. Um, And then we go over and we make the entire terrain solid from zero up to that height field spot. So that's pretty straightforward. And the computation of the height field is just this weighted Perlin noise summed. It's just a standard thing. The Perlin noise comes out of this function you know, file unoise, which is from a very old voxel engine of mine. And I didn't write any new code when I wrote that. I just copied that into this file. So. I didn't talk about that on the stream, and I'm not going to now. 
Uh, everything else is pretty much the same. <coughs> uh, I keep doing the wrong one. Let's take voxel render change and all for this. No. Okay, so that's it for that update. Then. Uh, okay, and then the last release from the missing stream. Uh, included getting it working and release. And looking up some of the statistics, so you can see the Q chunks shows that we're looking at 169 things at a time. The number in frustum is always the same because there's no frustum calling. Uh, the triangle count should be correct. It's actually drawing 2.8 million triangles, although, as noted, most of them are behind us. Uh, this is weird spike in the terrain is actually just a product of the procedural generation function. It just happens to be set up in a way that manages to generate a crazy spike that seems like discontinuous from the sort of heights around it. Um, and other than that, this is pretty much everything that I showed in that initial stream. So, there you go. And now you can move on to the actual streams and watch me struggle to actually code on the screen. All right. So, thanks for watching, and uh, that's it. Bye-bye.